Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, December 6th, 2011, and our special guest here tonight is Malia Dicker. Malia, welcome. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Your audio is just a little bit low. I don't know if you All right. uh, put your mic a little closer, or yeah. we can have you... Is this better? Oh, I'm just this playing. Perfect. Okay, great. Playing with the uh, settings here. Yep, wonderful. Great. Great job. <laughs> Trying to figure it out as I go. <laughs> yeah. The Future of Education is sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project. It's web20labs.com and by Blackboard Collaborate. They provide the room and some employment for me. Thank you, Blackboard. Coming up on the Future of Education, uh, another conversation this week. On Thursday night, Lisa Nielsen is going to talk to us about hacking education and all things outside the box. Next week, David Maxfield, one of the authors of some very influential books. One is called Influencer, another is called Crucial Conversations, and looking at that particular theory, set of theories as they relate to education. Max, those theories actually come out of something, out of a, uh, the work of a professor at Stanford named Albert Bandura, who coined the phrase social learning. So there should be some good ties. On the 14th, the EduBlog Awards show will be broadcast on the 15th, uh, the Blue Valley School CAPS program. I think students come and talk to us about that program. Really a great program. And lots, lots more. So hopefully there's something on that list that's of interest to you. In, in what um, Karen Cater called our boutique interview series. How's that? Do we like that as a description? If you've missed one of our shows, they are all recorded. Last week we had a great one on search literacy. Uh, Tasha Brooks and Michelson from Google led that. Um, before that, actually, we had Scott Nine on from um, IDEA or IDEA. Really, IDEA or IDEA? I can't IDEA. remember. Yeah, IDEA. Yeah, we're saying IDEA. Good. So we'll talk about that tonight. And uh, lots more, more fun. Um, and of course, the recordings for the Global Education Conference and the Library 2.011 conferences are up. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure how to respond to that Peggy Boutique interview series. I think I like that as a description. Okay, now on the map you can click on the star. It's the second icon down. And then click on the map. Thanks for giving a shout out, Peggy, for EduBloggerCon. Oh, there's EduCon. Uh, and EduBloggerCon is the Saturday before ISTE. We're actually changing the name of that to Social EdCon, and we have some other really fun surprises in store for people. So lots good coming up. Looks like someone from Hawaii. So uh, Helena, you can raise the volume by clicking on the audio slider in the audio and video area. I'm going to turn my volume up just a little and see how that does. EduCon is in January. That's at Science Leadership Academy. Well, glad to have you here in New Zealand and Hawaii and Canada. Feel free to give a shout out in the chat if you want to let us know any more details than that. It sounds like my volume is better. Thank you, Helena. So, uh, Malia, I'm going to call this show an indulgence. <laughs> And it's an indulgence because in our boutique interview series, we get to focus on things that um, I care about and are interesting to me. And you are particularly interesting to me. Well, thank you. Yes. And um, I'm getting a little bit of echo now. I don't know if anybody else is. Mm -hmm. But it may be, it's, I think it's just because you're, you put your volume up and we hear a tiny bit coming back. So if you wouldn't mind, it will also help me conduct the interview. When you're not talking, just click your talk button off. Sure. And that will also kind of signal to me that you're done answering the question. So you did something really interesting. And uh, when you were 28, you retraced your steps through education from kindergarten to college in order to reboot your life and make a fresh start. And this is really fun. I really want to talk about it. Um, can you give us a little bit of an idea of your background prior to this uh, reschooling yourself? How would you have described yourself before that? 
Yeah, well, I grew up in Northern California in a small town, Sonoma, and I went to school uh, in public schools um, through middle school and then went to high school and college at private schools. So I kind of, I had a pretty traditional experience in school and from a young age I was very, I grew very dependent on other people's approval and rewards and it wasn't that my parents were particularly pressuring me to achieve, but it's just where I found my niche was as a student. You know, a lot of other students were great artists or athletes or musicians, and I did, you know, I kind of dabbled in those things, but um, really school was where I excelled and where I found my identity. So, you know, I would, I also had a lot of anxiety around maintaining that role sort of as a super achiever and, you know, one that really pleased the teachers and pleased my parents and kind of always knew the right answer in school. Um, and so it never was really fun for me. Um, I think I can remember some, you know, some projects that I enjoyed, but I think for the most part it was very much about, you know, gritting my teeth and, and excelling and achieving in school. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of carried that attitude, you know, through high school and through college and, you know, when I came out the other side, you know, graduated diploma and had done very well in school, I just felt really lost. Um, and I realized that, you know, being a great student didn't necessarily make me a very successful adult. And in fact, I think the training in school kind of got in my way as, a, as an adult because I wasn't used to making my own decisions. I was waiting for instructions and waiting for a road map, um, someone to tell me exactly how to do something to get the right answer. But, you know, once I was on my own, no one was there to do that for me. So um, do you want me to keep going about my, you know, what I ended up doing, doing after that? Not yet, because I want to ask a couple <laughs> questions here. Sure. So I'm curious about the degree to which this narrative, the story you're telling, reflects our current kind of crisis with traditional institutions. Meaning, um, if we weren't kind of going through the this phase of the web and uh, the, this current sense of um, um, mass customization, both in products and as individuals, if we weren't kind of experiencing the voice of the web, do you think that you would have just said, this is just kind of how life is? How much of this realization do you think is is dependent on living in a certain period of time? Well, I, I actually, since I'm, you know, I'm 31 now, um, I experience school differently than students today. Um, I, you know, I remember typewriters and <laughs> record players and all those things, and we didn't have a computer in my house until I was 15. So, um, and also, you know, we had a lot more, we had more funding uh, when I was in school, so I did get things like music and art for the better part of my education. Um, so, yeah, can you uh, elaborate on the question? I'm wondering. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about our oldest daughter who's 23. And I can remember kind of a very specific moment in time when I realized that the kind of obedience that we had taught her, she was the first child of two first children, mm -hmm. that the, you know, uh, stay quiet in class, you know, you know, sort of the traits that we taught her. At a certain point in time I realized those really aren't the, the traits that I think she's going to need now to, to feel good about herself and to do well. And it was, it was sort of an interesting cultural shift. And I wondered if, you know, if you had been born 50 years earlier, mm -hmm. would you have gone through the same kind of awakening? Or would you just have said, this is just how it is? Yeah, um, I actually um, thought about that question. I read a book called The, the Self-Esteem Trap, I think it's called. Um, it's about how my parents' generation really, um, their parents are really focused on, you know, survival, so they didn't get a lot of affection and, and how they in turn were just, you know, said to themselves, when I have children, I'm going to give them lots of love and coddle them and really make life easy for them because it was so difficult for me and I've had to work, you know, for everything that I, I have. And so, you know, my, my parents and, um, you know, my peers' parents did a great job of providing for us and, you know, making our lives relatively easy. Um, and I'm from a solidly middle class background, so, you know, fortunate not to, to want for a lot of things. But at the same time, that didn't give me a sense of really self-reliance and knowing that I could do something and make things happen because I, you know, I was always provided for and kind of always had um, a safe environment and so I felt, you know, very lost and um, sort of I didn't know that I could do things on my own when I graduated school. So I think you're right. I mean, if I had been born 50 years earlier, I think I wouldn't have had a lot of 
options also. It's just a, this culture where we have so many, you know, you're told when you're young that you can be anything and do anything, which is amazing in one sense, and it's also extremely overwhelming in another sense because, you know, to this day I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what is the thing that's my dream and I'm going to be the best at, and I don't honestly know if there is that for everybody, um, and it's, it is a little overwhelming to have so many options. We're very blessed, but it also can be really challenging. You've raised some really interesting points. What was the name of the book? Uh, the Self-Esteem Trap. The Self-Esteem Trap. Okay. Um, you and I talked by phone at one point in time, and I made a note about what I'm going to call the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's officially called that, but it's this sense that you, uh, the, the, what I'm doing, uh, um, I'm kind of faking it, and, nobody, and if anybody were to really figure out who I was, they would realize that I'm kind of an imposter. And as I recall, this is something that often afflicts uh, women in greater numbers. Mm. Do you think that from your experience as you're looking back and now describing your schooling life the way it was, do you think that part of this imposter syndrome could stem from what takes place in schools? I do. Um, I mean, I think you're supposed to pretend that you have the answers in school even if you don't. Um, and I do think that women, you know, are, are kind of just subconsciously taught to, to be more in the background. And so, you know, I didn't develop, especially as an Asian woman, I'm half Asian, my mom is Asian, um, also had kind of a cultural legacy of being, you know, humble in the background and not sort of owning a lot of space and taking up a lot of space in the room. So, um, and I think school definitely enforces that because you were supposed to be quiet. And I remember very clearly in first grade, you know, my teacher taught us to sit up straight with our back straight, our hands folded on the desk, and then, you know, track her with our eyes. And so I mastered that, you know, day one. Um, and so, <laughs> of course, as you go, as you grow up and get into the adult world, that is, does not serve you to, you know, sit in a boardroom where you're supposed to be generating ideas out of the box and, you know, really pushing back on things, you know, to sit with your hands folded and, and just wait for instruction. So we have four children. The, the first I've described this process we went through. The next two were very independent. In fact, challenged this quite a bit as parents, and we kept saying, "Okay, you know, spirited children become great adults. <laughs> spirited <laughs> children become great adults." Our last child, who's five years behind the others, uh, is in eighth grade, and she loves school. She loves the structure, the organization, and everything. But she comes home exhausted, and mm -hmm. I can tell that there's, you know, a lot going on there emotionally. What kind of advice would you give parents or teachers who? are seeing students who really, really want to do what's right, who love the structure, but you can you can sense maybe there's an emotional toll taking place for them. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely encourage them not to put too much stock in, you know, grades and um, gold stars and the things that, you know, she might be um, chasing a little bit. And even if she, if she enjoys it, you know, just kind of, have a conversation, you know, with her and, and make sure that's what's happening. And she really loves the learning process and isn't sort of thriving on the rewards and um, dependence on praise and so on because, you know, it, it's setting her up for a fall, I think, later on when those things aren't, aren't there. Um, and also just, you know, being a good model, I think, for her of, um, you know, making mistakes and, and talking about them as part of life, um, pursuing, the, you know, your interests and not having a relationship with work like, you know, like I did with school, where it's like you just kind of go through the motions and, um, because you have to. You know, it's really about you can choose your path, um, even from a young age, and um, kind of seeing through the, the, uh, the game and the system of school. And so even if, you know, you want to get to college and you have to take a certain number of years of math and, you know, take certain tests to get in, you understand that that's all part of the game and it's not necessarily um, real learning. So this 13-year-old has taught me a lot, uh, and part of what she's taught me is that there, it does feel as though sometimes schools get blamed for creating a sense of conformity, when mm -hmm. I feel as though there may actually be an age issue, Some, you know, that at this age they're very socially conscious, mm -hmm. very anxious to do what other people are doing. You know, to, to what degree do you feel that the system itself created that circumstance for you, and, and are there parts of this that are just kind of part of the human story of going through early teenagehood or, or whatever stages of life where we feel that kind of pressure? 
Yeah, it's interesting you ask that. I've worked with middle school kids for four or five years, so I definitely saw that that, I do think that that is a developmental um, stage where it really becomes all about, you know, what your friends think and fitting in and just blending in and um, not standing out, except for a very, you know, rare few people who really enjoy that. Um, I think, I think that tendency is extended not only through adolescence, but in school, you know, when little kids, you know, I've been around little kids as well, and they don't really think about it as much, um, like, you know, the kindergarten age or pre-kindergarten, um, about conforming. It seems like they're just happy to be, you know, their own little free spirits and kind of just be who they naturally are. Um, and I know we're going to get to the reschool years <laughs> experience, but um, I had the, you know, experience of um, seeing day one of kindergarten. And so, you know, seeing these kids who had been on their own for, you know, four or five years and then walk into a classroom for the first time and want to play with cars, but no, it's time for reading. So we have to, you know, put aside your interests and then do what the group is doing, what the teacher is instructing the group to do. So I think you know, from that point, you can just see the shift where um, it just becomes not about you anymore and about your internal compass and what your instincts are telling you to do. It's really about what the, you know, adult authority is instructing you is the right thing. And so it's really easy to lose that sense of self and that inner compass in school. So when I interviewed Scott, who now is a colleague of yours from mm -hmm. IDEA, you know, Scott continually sort of stressed the need for balance between sort of the freedoms and the structure. And do you feel the same kind of uh, strong sense that I got from him that, that it's really important to, to have both? I do, yeah. I think most of us at IDEA have gone through a similar journey where, you know, we realized we had been traditionally schooled and then, you know, came across um, various forms of democratic education and kind of went to the opposite extreme for a little bit in our beliefs and practices um, about, you know, total freedom and self-direction and, you know, kids should do what they want and um, not be controlled or coerced. And I think there's definitely a degree of truth to that. Um, and then also, you know, we all kind of ended up coming back to the middle, kind of of that balance you're talking about between freedom and structure, where there are some things that you need to know in the world to access power and to achieve your goals and even have the awareness of what, what your goals are. Um, so you need to know how to read, you need to know how to do basic math, and you need to have some cultural awareness and global awareness. Um, so I do, I do believe in that structure, you know, and I think as far as finding that, um, that balance, it's going to look really different, you know, in every community, in every classroom, in every family, with every student. Okay, so you are s stressed out, you're depressed on the inside, you, um, you go, don't you work for Spark before you do your preschooling? Yes. Yeah, so after college, um, I, you know, did a few things like went to Spain and you know, took some time off and then I did a program called Public Allies that um, trained you know, or developed young leaders um, from their own communities. And so I knew going into Public Allies, it's an AmeriCorps program, that I wanted to start a nonprofit in education. So I was able to use that 10 months of um, experience to kind of gear up for that, starting a nonprofit with a good friend of mine named Chris Ball. Um, and so we had both, you know, had a similar experience in school ourselves and then had seen, you know, as tutors and teachers, we'd seen that, that disengagement process happening to students, the same kind of thing that happened to us. And we had taken it the route of, okay, well, we don't like it, but we're going to do it and, you know, excel at it and get out. Um, and some of the students that we were working with, you know, we noticed that they were um, really just checking out and um, getting close to dropping out. So, you know, those, those are kind of two different paths that you can take. Um, so we decided to work with middle school kids and start Spark. Uh, middle school is a time where students really are finding those identities and kind of getting on a path. You know, you said the friend groups, and in school you kind of decide where you fit. Um, and so we knew middle school was this crucial time to really engage kids and have them see the relevance, you know, and the connection between their dreams and their future and then what they were doing in school today. So um, we started, you know, with 12 students, a summer program where the students picked their dreams job that they wanted to try out and we matched them with a mentor in that field, so a filmmaker or a lawyer or a doctor and they got a hands-on experience during that summer. And then after that 
you know, first summer in 2005, the program grew to after school, and then it grew to other cities, and so, um, you know, now it's in Redwood City, San Francisco, LA, Chicago, and it's growing beyond that. So. I, I loved Spark in one way. I loved seeing the, the kids lit up in a way that a lot of them hadn't been before. A lot of these students were, you know, from low-income families. Um, some were very bright, struggled in school because they just didn't care and they were bored. They didn't see how it related to their lives. Um, and so seeing them in an apprenticeship uh, really engaged and excited and, you know, couldn't stop talking about what they were learning, um, really lit up, you know, and for me that just like warmed my heart and put a smile on my face and at the same time I was, I found myself really jealous, <laughs> I had this surprising experience of being jealous of these 13 year olds because I hadn't really gotten that experience or at least in my adult life um, hadn't felt that kind of engagement or joy maybe at all. Um, and running a nonprofit, you know, turned out not to be my dream job. So I was telling the kids on one hand, you know, you can do whatever you want, pursue your dreams, and then they saw me, you know, on the phone, stressed out, you know, grumpy, and, you know, to them, I think my actions were saying that, you know, once you um, get to be an adult, and, you know, it's kind of a grind, and you got to, you know, just buckle down and do it, where I really wanted them to know that they could be engaged, and that's what they were seeing from their mentors is, you know, people living their, their dreams. So um, I decided to leave Spark after four years of being a co-director, um, and then Chris took over as executive director. And um, so I decided that, you know, I took some time off on the coast, you know, during the holidays that year. It was 2007, um, and just thought about, you know, what is it that's going to kind of um, heal me and reboot my life. Um, so I decided, you know, school was really the core issue that I needed to make peace with. So that's how Reschool Yourself was born. I'm going to bring up the website. I'm very interested in th that point of decision making. It can't have been easy to say, you know, I've got to, I've got to shift gears or I've got to almost start over. Mm -hmm. Did, you know, uh, was it a relief once you thought of it? And what gave you the idea? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was both a relief and it was terrifying. Um, so I, you know, I knew at the end of the fall of 2007 that I needed to leave Spark, and it wasn't good for anyone. You know, that I was stressed out at work, and you know, for the kids and my coworkers, and I really didn't want to be that person, even though it was my baby. You know, that I helped start this organization and grown it, and um, didn't really know who I'd be without Spark. You know, in the same way that I didn't know who I would have been without school. You know, as a student. So I, I took some time, you know, just away on the coast and took a four-day retreat just by myself and just to think about my next steps. And I was actually reading the book Eat, Pray, Love. <laughs> and so, you know, 50 pages through, I just dropped the book and I was like, wow, you know, I need to do this, but with school, you know, I need to take this year to go back through my education and just figure out what happened, you know, like why did I end up on this path, you know, that I, I realized um, it was the wrong path for me, um, and what can I do to, to reset that. So I just needed to stop, you know, in my tracks and just evaluate my next steps, and it turned out instead of going forward, you know, on this path that I was on, I just needed to retrace my steps backwards to the very beginning so I could kind of reevaluate and then sort of relive my education in, in the way that I wanted to and understand what had happened the first time around that had gone kind of awry. So was there a model for this? Had you heard of anybody doing anything kind of comparable in terms of going back to a starting point and then sort of living through each stage? I, you know, I'm kind of reminded of some counsel that, that parents sometimes get that uh, you know, children have to go through every stage to get to sort of a final place. But was there something like that that, that kind of served as a framework for this idea of going back? No, there wasn't. I mean, I've always loved the movie Billy Madison, <laughs> but no, that was not the inspiration, even the Adam Sandler movie where he relives his education. That didn't cross my mind except as a joke. But um, no, it was more just instinct. I mean, I had, for as long as I could remember after I'd left school, I would, when I went back home to Sonoma for the holidays, I would always feel compelled to go take a walk around my old school campuses and just kind of revisit the different places there and sit with the memories. And I later, you know, just started calling these memory walks. And at the time, I just didn't know why, but I just felt like I had to go. And sometimes I would sit down and write and just sort of let the memories resurface. But I felt like I had a lot of unfinished business at the schools. And I felt like it was very emotionally charged every time 
I walked onto campus, um, you know, I, in my middle school, once I walked, you know, over to the gym and just peeked my head in and saw the students in their PE uniforms playing basketball, and I had no conscious thought of having a painful memory of that, but I just, tears started welling up in my eyes, and I just was kind of overcome with emotion, and so I just was like, wow, I really need to look at this, you know, what is all this stuff that's just under the surface? Um, so I just, it's one of those things that just kind of came to me that I, the only way to really deal with that was to go back and intentionally trigger those memories so I could kind of cleanse myself of them and start fresh. Okay, so <laughs> three months, right? Yeah, three months in the classroom, yeah. Week by week, moving grade by grade? That's right. Yeah, starting the first day of school in kindergarten at my old elementary school, and then, yeah, pretty more or less a week in each grade through college. Okay, so who did you have to talk to to arrange this, and uh, did you, uh, when did you start? What month of the year? Yeah, it was August when I started, and then I um, I started kind of putting out the feelers and making arrangements January of 2008 to start in August. And so, um, luckily, Sonoma is a very small town, and I, you know, my parents live five minutes walk from my elementary school, and some of some of the teachers uh, that were there when I was a student um, are still there. And then also we have um, some family friends who are now teachers there. Uh, so I reached out to a couple of them that I knew. Um, my mom had their email address. One went to the We're losing your mic. For some I don't know if it's something okay. you did or no, you're back. No, strange. Okay, hey. Yeah, I just went down on its own. Um, yeah, so uh, being a small town, it was pretty to out to the district. So it's happening again, Malia. Oh, I wonder okay. if your cord is catching on something. You know what? Maybe that's it. There's a little volume control here. Sorry about that. It's kind of doing it on its own, like a ghostly presence. <laughs> okay. So I'll pay attention to, to it good. all. Okay. Yeah. I'll just stare at it <laughs> and make sure it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't go. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, don't, I really don't know what's happening. It just is sliding back down on its own. Oh, is it the audio slider? slider. It's, yeah, audio the audio. Again? Yeah. Okay. Go up to. Um, View, no, let's see, edit, edit. preferences. All right. Let's see, preferences, okay. And then go down, down to the audio video and look for the microphone settings. Mm-hmm. And there should be a button that says adjust volume automatically that's checked. Ah, okay. So uncheck and it? Uncheck that, yeah. There we go. It was ghostly and moving by itself. All right. Unchecked. <laughs> So um, I can hear a little echo, but is this okay, this volume? Yep, you're doing great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure where you lost me, but um, Sonoma was is is very small, and so you know I just reached out to some of the teachers at the elementary school and middle school and high school, and um, that you know the teachers in the high school. As I got you know to the older grades, the teachers that I had had were still there, so it was really easy to email my advisor and uh, you know some of my favorite teachers to get permission for this. So they became my advocates, you know, for the principal who ultimately gave permission, um, and then with the, the the school district from elementary school, I needed to get fingerprints, and um, I actually had had asked them originally to be a volunteer in the younger grades classes, because that's kind of what I had pictured originally, is I couldn't really picture myself, um, or I hadn't had the idea originally to be a kid again. It was more being in the environment that I had in mind and writing about that experience um, of just more observing and being a sort of classroom aide. But, um, you know, the first, I think it was in, even in kindergarten, just in the first few days, I just realized that, you know, I really needed to go through those processes again and actually be a student and do what they did in class and on the playground. So I kind of shifted my role from an adult volunteer to uh, a classroom participant. How did the other students respond, and did it depend on age? It did. It absolutely did. Yeah, the younger kids were, they didn't, you know, they were too young, especially kindergarten, first grade, to understand what I was doing there. And I think they were used to volunteers and classroom aides, so they just, you know, they liked that I was there to play with and to open and tell me if someone was 
you know, so I tried as much as possible to say, no, I'm just one of you guys, you know, tell your teacher if you need something. Um, and then as I got older, the students would come up and say, yeah, taking notes and they wanted to see what I was doing. Malia, we're getting a really funny static you sound again from your mic. It's really loud and now it's gone away. I'm okay. wondering if it's possible that the cord is I think rubbing against anything. I think or that's right. I'm so sorry about the technical no, no. difficulties. You're doing fine. Yeah. Okay. If it happens again, let me know. I can uh, unplug and untangle. Well, when I talked to you before, I made some notes. Uh, finger painting was a big deal for you. <laughs> PE. Um, changing in the locker room. Uh, did you discover that there were things that had been hard for you or troublesome that you didn't think about in advance, or, or what kinds of things sort of became evident as you went through it? Um, sorry about this. Oh, so Peggy yeah. is suggesting you unplug your mic and plug it back in. Okay, let me do that. Let's try that. Just a, mo just a moment. So I heard you, but it's not coming through the actual okay. microphone. It doesn't sound like, or did it maybe switch to a different? Do you have an internal mic on the computer? I do. Is it back now? Well, it is, but we're hearing you through the uh, through. I think the internal mic instead of. Did you have a headset on before? I do. Yeah. Okay. So go up to Tools Audio, and under Microphone Settings, just make sure it's clicked on your headset. Yep, it should be. Yeah. And I think we have you back. Malia, are you there? So we heard that sort of staticky sound again, and then it's gone. If you need to, you can go back and just put it back on the internal microphone. And you do so by going up to Tools, Audio, and then selecting sort of the normal mic. We're hearing something. Are you there? If you're talking, we're not hearing you, but we do hear some sort of static. Um, there you go. Can you go. hear me now? Okay, I'm just going to unplug. Yeah. Can you I think hear me now? Yeah, I think you're. So just be sure to turn your mic off when so you're not talking because we'll get echoed this way. But it's better, okay. it's better than the static. It's better than the static. Yeah, of course. Okay. And then turn your mic up a little if you wouldn't mind. Do that by just moving the slider bar up. And be sure to press talk. Okay. Do you, do you hear me? You're back. Okay. Whew. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was working at first, so I don't know what's going on. Okay. So were there things that came up that you didn't expect or that were really surprisingly emotion-filled? Yes. Um, one story that comes to mind is uh, second grade. We were drawing, um, we were doing an illustration for a story called Dragon Gets By. And um, so that the teacher, you know, said, okay, open your textbooks to, you know, page 60 and just pick a, a frame to illustrate, you know, to, to copy, basically. There were different illustrations that we could work on. And so, you know, we set to work um, on illustrating that scene. And about 10 minutes in, you know, I was really into my pencil drawing. And the teacher said, okay, it's time to wrap up. You know, we're going to close our books and put them away and we're going to do some math. And I, you know, I had that moment of panic, just like, no, no, I, I want to keep drawing. I don't want to do math. And so, you know, I, I had to really steel myself not to use my adult privileges and keep drawing my picture while everyone else put away their stuff. But it really occurred to me, you know, this is what had happened a lot in school is that the things I was really interested in doing um, were kind of limited um, just by the school schedule, by the things we were supposed to know, and um, art was something that I had never fully explored. You know, I, had, I had dabbled in it a little bit and I really enjoyed it, but I had never really gotten to pursue it as much as I wanted to, especially in school hours and so it just occurred you know I had a sense of like regret and longing and emotion just about that sort of lost opportunity and wondering you know who would I would be today if I had been able to uh, pursue all the things I wanted to kind of without 
not without limit exactly, but just to the fullest extent. Fascinating. Okay, so uh, as you got into the higher grades, how did things change? Yeah, um, well, as soon as the students, you asked about the reaction from the students. Um, so in middle school, the kids were really fascinated by the project and wanted to know if one student came up to me. It was a boy. He was probably about 12. And he's like, no offense, but are you a girl or a teenager or a woman? <laughs> and I was, didn't know how to really answer that. But um, I just explained you know, that I was a grown up and being a student for you know that, that week in his grade. So they were a little more interested than I'd say the high school or college age because in high school, and I remember being very self-absorbed, you know, just in retrospect, um, and the students very much were wrapped up in their own lives and didn't really pay much attention to me. And in college, you know, there's people of all different ages, so they didn't really, um, they didn't you know, really notice me as much. Um, so yeah, and as, as far as, did you ask also about just how the experience changed as I went through the process and advanced through the grades? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I just went through a lot of different um, phases as far as the memories that were coming back and then the things that I wanted to, or I, I ended up learning. Um, third grade was a really magical time for me and it's funny because I talked to a couple of the third grade teachers who had taught different grades and said that, you know, third grade was this time before, you know, testing really got ramped up and um, requirements and grades started in fourth grade, at least, you know, in the California schools that I was a part of. Um, um, and so it was a time where they could do a lot more enrichment um, and have more fun. And so it was kind of this like last beacon of childhood. And so I made a lot of friends in third grade. And um, we, you know, they tried to teach me to do cartwheels at recess. And we did double dutch. And it just reminded me of what it was like to be a kid. And um, you know, there's a some saying that. Um, kids laugh, you know, 115 times a day and adults laugh 14 times a day or something like that. And it made me think about how um, infrequently I laughed and how serious I took everything, you know, as an adult and just reminded me to not take things so seriously and to play and to go on the swings once in a while. So um, third grade was really, it was amazing. Um, there was a teacher, actually a good friend of my family's named Tim Curley and he's a third grade teacher. He was a musician and he teaches through music. And this is a you know public school classroom. Um, this school, I think, you know, was challenged with a lot of English language learners, so their scores weren't, you know, where they needed to be. And at any rate, he still was able to teach his students, you know, the curriculum that's required through music. So they would they were writing a song one day about cause and effect in science. And so they, you know, through that process of writing a song as a class, they he taught them so many things about collaboration, about experimentation, about rhythm and rhyme and, you know, all the kind of disciplines blended together in that lesson and every single student in the class was engaged and, you know, tapping out the tune on their, or their, the rhythm on their desks and, you know, looking, um, just their faces were lit up and I had never seen that before in a classroom. So as you kind of tell this story now, are there big lessons that you try and communicate, especially as it relates to how we structure and think about school? Definitely. Um, I'm, Tim Curley is someone that I use as an example a lot of just what good teaching can look like um, because of the setting he's in, um, because he it's not that he's in a fancy private school where, you know, all the students are English speakers and, you know, have supportive parents. It's not like that. It's very diverse. It's very, it's very much um, Latino, English language learners, and the school doesn't have, you know, a ton of, of money. So, you know, he has just basically normal circumstances in his classroom, yet he's able to engage his students because he is teaching through his passion, which is music. And every teacher has a passion like that that they can incorporate, you know, into the school day, whether, you know, it's art or computer science or what have you. Um, you know, I remember my second grade teacher, you know, the first time around, really loved birds. And so she taught us all birding, you know, and, and science was a part of that and, you know, and nature and and facts, you know, just memorizing the different types of birds and I still that sticks with me today because she was so passionate about it and I would have no cause to be into that um, if not for her. So um, yeah, I think that good, you know, good schools and good, good teachers, it's about really bringing your own passion to the classroom room and then also having a relationship with the children that's just mutually respectful. Um, 
and also just a sense of play and fun in everything that you do, um, even um, even when you have to, you know, do certain things like spelling tests, for example. You know, Tim Curley would have the kids read the spelling, you know, spell into a microphone, and then he would do little sound effects, you know, and just really silly things that he didn't have to do um, that he just brought into the mix so the students were engaged and excited about it. So is there a direct connection in between this experience and um, IDEA? What, what, what brings you from one to the next? Yeah, so once I, I wrapped up Reschool Yourself, um, I ended up moving across the country. My husband is from Mississippi, so I moved from San Francisco to Jackson, Mississippi, and was kind of evaluating, you know, my next steps. And I took kind of a year um, to really just get my bearings and figure out my next steps and, you know, a lot of personal development, you know, through music and all the kind of things I'd wanted to try out um, in the past but had never let myself um, or I was too busy, you know, with work to do. So that opened up the space for um, for IDEA, for me to be involved in IDEA with um, several different educators that I'd met through uh, conferences around the country. Um, the International Democratic Education Conference is one that brought um, Dana Bennis and me together in 2003. And then in 2008, I met Scott Nine and Jenna Kanner. And we all just immediately connected and kind of gravitated toward each other because of that kind of personal journey that I mentioned before that we'd all kind of come back to the, you know, a balanced approach to democratic education. And also we had worked on the ground in programs and then really were looking for a way to, to advance democratic education on the national level and bring a different narrative to the dialogue than, you know, testing and reform and achievement, a whole different vocabulary and a whole different way of looking at what's possible. Um, so we ended up starting this organization idea to do that um, and became, you know, staff and that was, you know, it's been around for almost two years now. So, so we had a good, a good visit with Scott about this and kind of the, the stage at which the organization is at. Sort of striking to me is the difference between Arrow and IDEA. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I interviewed Jerry from Arrow, I get the sense that it was, and I've said this before, you know, it's very much about um, really having the students run the school. An idea seems to be a, a better and more palatable balance. Do you find that you're getting that kind of traction? Um, sorry, are you being static again? I heard a little bit. Okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> is it gone now? It's gone now. Okay, fantastic. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think we have two different audiences, and there's some overlap. You know, it's like a Venn diagram with Arrow and Idea. I think there are some, you know, very there's some core values we have in common about, you know, respecting children and incorporating self-direction, passionate, engaged learning, and also there are some differences. Um, like you said, we take a much more, I think, structured, balanced approach, and and are aware that there are things that kids need to learn, um, you know, to, like I said, access power in the world. Um, and so w we don't talk about, you know, democratic education as do whatever you you please. Um, I know that even, you know, with Arrow, they talk about, you know, having a governing council and, you know, within reason so you don't step on other people's freedoms. But we focus less on, you know, everyone has a vote and really just about, uh, Developing change makers for the 21st century, um, having students who are aware of social justice, aware of the challenges in the world and their place in the world, and understanding you know, that they need to develop the power to meet those challenges and the, having the desire to do that as well. So uh, Kirsten is probing a little, uh, asking about this, you know, uh, what's unpalatable about students running the schools. Um, I, you know, I, I said that within the context of how people respond to a movement, and I feel as though in um, the same way that oftentimes the best things that we can do for prisons, if you read the material in prisons, for instance, is to have the inmates actually helping to run the prison. But it's just politically not attractive to people. And um, so I'm wondering, so we can probe on this a little bit, um, Malia, which is mm -hmm. uh, how, you know, how do you feel about the sort of the sense that to be, to learn to be in a democratic society, you actually need to have more democratic processes in school, and you've kind of drawn a line where it's important to you and it's not, but how, you know, how do you feel about those instances where students are actually sort of actively involved in running the school? I think, I mean, I think that's a wonderful, 
process and practice to go through, and I think that can look a lot of different ways. Um, and I do think that you know what democratic education is about is having that ownership and that participation and engagement, and that each person is actively involved in what's happening. So not to say that they, you know, have control or one person one vote and not down to that specific level, but I would call what Tim Curley is doing in his public school classroom democratic education because the students are active co-creators of their own learning. So I think that, you know, if there's a democratic council in the classroom, that can be one way that it can look. And that's you know, that's wonderful. Um, I think it really just depends on the circumstance, you know, within a certain group of people. Um, you know, how successful that is, and I don't think it's, it is democratic education just because there's a certain structure um, and a certain governance. Am I answering your question? Yes, and we're getting some good uh, discussion in the chat as well. So when people ask you your definition of democratic education, what, what do you say? Yeah, uh, we the official idea <laughs> definition is learning that equips every human being to to thrive in a healthy democracy. So I, again, I think that leaves the door open for a lot of different um, ways of of learning and being. But we recognize that. Um, you have to have a degree of understanding of social justice, of sustainability, and um, becoming a change maker, basically. Um, Sorry, I don't think I'm <laughs> answering that very well. <laughs> I think you've answered it well, and I and I think so. You're focused less on the democratic process and more on developing the skills to to live well in a democracy. Yes, exactly. Uh, hey, we're getting that darn. Yeah, I know. I'm. Again. I'm what is sorry. This? I really don't know. I mean, I don't know if it has to do with my headset, but you know, and it's never been a problem before. So I'm going to apologize. Well, don't worry about it. No, hey. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we're going to open up to, to Q&A. We'll, we'll start that now. I, I, while we're kind of building questions there, if a question hasn't uh, been recognized in the chat, please post it again, or, or you can raise your hand using the third icon over in the participant area. I want to ask you about your work on social media and online communities. Um, t tell me what experiences you had there and what you feel like you've learned. Sure. Yeah, with IDEA, a large part of what I do is social media. Um, so we have a community on Facebook and Twitter, and that's a large part of um, how we started engaging folks and letting people know that we were a resource for democratic learning practices. Um, and so the first thing, you know, we, we kicked off our organization in 2009 in the fall. We had our website, and that was the first place that, you know, people could come and learn about us. And then the Facebook community is really what's taken hold, I think, is one of the most successful tools that we've had to reach people. Um, I've heard, you know, Scott referred to someone on, on when you interviewed him who is an administrator, you know, education administrator in a large city and who feels very disgruntled with, you know, her work but feels like the Facebook community just gives her hope because it shares, uh, you know, articles in the mainstream media about amazing learning, that's learning programs that are happening. You can immediately connect with other folks who, you know, have the same desires for education and um, have you know, active projects going on in their classrooms, some are teachers, where they can just share amongst themselves, you know, best practices and, you know, ideas that you can kind of customize to your own classroom. Um, it's just a place where I think a lot of people have found a kinship and a tribe. I'm looking for the link to that Facebook page. I'm not seeing yeah, it on, on the, the website. Where would that be? It's on the home page. Um, there's a Facebook icon on our home page, but um, yeah, and it's just uh, facebook.com slash democratic education. Let's see if I can take us there. Does that look right? Yeah, that is. That's the showcase that it, it defaults to showing you. And then you can click on the wall and kind of see the different conversations that are happening and the different kinds of articles that we share. And a lot of the people who are in our community post their own articles, which is a great, you know, it's some things that we haven't seen yet. So we invite people to do that. Okay, so Lori says, with her middle school students, she's surprised not to see leadership skills among the talented students. Do you have suggestions to have individuals rise to their potential? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a role for everyone in the classroom, and it's just about, you know, helping them find what it is that they'd like to learn and also encouraging them, you know, not to just take on the roles that they naturally gravitate toward. Um, I know in, for me in school, I was kind of a wallflower and um, very much more comfortable with being the note taker and being in the background, but it would have been, you know, really helpful, I think, to have a sort of teacher, coach, mentor to help me step up and develop that confidence in public speaking, for example or facilitating a group activity and kind of rotate the students through the different roles so they can kind of try on different um, and that's really what adolescence is about too is just trying on different hats so I think that kind of opportunity would be helpful. Karima wants to know what does democratic education look like in practical terms at the school or classroom level? What and how do students learn? Yeah, well, one example I think of is um, we do these innovation tours um, in different cities around the country through IDEA, and so we have a group of about 30 participants from the community, and so we choose in each city four different sites that we One of them is... Malia, we've lost your audio and we're hearing that static again. Are you there? In case you're trying to figure it out, we're still not hearing you. Are you hearing me? Oh, we heard bits and pieces there. You're coming back. No, we're not hearing anything. I don't know if you still have your headset plugged in. Okay, there we hear something. There we hear something. Okay. Do you hear something now? Yes, you're back. Okay. I just unplugged it and replugged it again. I'm sorry. I honestly don't know what's happening, but um but um yeah, I was telling you about the iSchool. I'm not sure how much you heard, but um Well I we, I I've taken us to the innovation tours. And that's yeah. about, I think, where we lost you. Okay. Well, um, one of the schools that we visited on our New York innovation tour is called the I School, and it's a public school. It's a small school, and so some of the, in practice, you know, some of the, the projects the students are working on, um, they have these modules where they, you know, they have different blocks of um, where they, you know, have the curriculum, the you know, requirements like math and English. Although, you know, the classes are. Um, they tend to be, you know, more interesting takes on the subjects, um, and they also have modules. Um, one example that I always think of is uh, looking at 9/11 in the historical and cultural context, you know, from the Crusades to the present. So the students, you know, who live in New York City and were around during 9/11, understood how it all came to pass and what it meant for different people in the world. And so they actually interviewed, you know, these students who are about 15, 16 years old, interviewed through Skype a lot of different teenagers in other countries and other areas of our country. So they ask them, you know, what's your perspective on 9-11? And so they got to see a from a teenager in Afghanistan, a teenager from Mississippi, you know, and so they understood that you can look at the same event so differently and you can understand, you know, how it fits into our history. So for me that was just fascinating. I had never experienced anything myself in school like that where, it's, you know, it's history. It's, it's part of the curriculum, but it, me it meant a lot to them personally. So they actually, the students developed monologues around the interviews they did, and it actually became part of an exhibit at the Grand Zero 9-11 Memorial. So I mean, that's such a powerful example of learning for me because, I mean, it's, they felt it so in such a relevant way to their lives, and they could see in the real world the product of their learning um, showcased for other people. Uh, to, to enjoy, to participate in. So Monica's here, and Monica always pushes the envelope, and she says, do you think we'll ever get out of the classroom? <laughs> I wonder if you mean, uh, <laughs> you know, education, school, you know, what those words mean, you think of just the classroom. And I, I mean, I think IDEA is inclusive with democratic education. Um, in all different settings, you know, we um, on the urban innovation tour, um, you know, some of the students got outside of the classroom and looked at um, sustainable.
public are in. Um, you know, we talk about after school programs. Uh, the Point was another another site on um, this past innovation tour in New York, um, and it, that's a community center, and it really involves the whole neighborhood. So, I mean, I think <laughs> I I think democratic education is happening already in a lot of different settings. I, I think Spark is democratic education, you know, students and apprenticeships in the workplace, um, after school and summer programs. Um, I think. You know, the teachers who bring um, democratic education into the classroom try to get out of that classroom as much as possible on field trips. You know, in El Verano, my elementary school, the third graders were creating you know soda um, bottle rockets, so they would see how far you know how high they were able to go when they configured them in different ways. So I think um, I think education has to evolve to be at least as, as much out of the classroom as it is inside the classroom. Peggy is wondering uh, how the places are selected that you go to for the innovation tours. Yeah, um, we actually have a list of criteria on our website. Um, I think it's democratic education slash curating. Um, and so those just kind of summarize the different values that we have and what we look for in the school site. But um, you know, anyone can propose a site to us. Some of the ones we picked in New York, which is where our first tour was, were sites that uh, Dana Bennis and Jenna Canner, who were who were on our team, they were, they were from New York, and so they were already familiar with them. But the point was a new one for us, and so basically there's a process. We go through visiting the school, meeting the, the students and the teachers, and um, really getting a sense you know, how the school fits or site. You know, it doesn't have to be a school. It could be a program or a community center, how they fit into these guidelines of ours. So the schools uh, obviously are different, have differences. Uh, they still fit within your uh, guidelines for, for matching the, the criteria. Are there commonalities in terms of how the schools are run or how they connect with their communities that you can identify as being really significantly the drivers of these kinds of school experiences? Well, the students as active participants in some way is a core part of it. Um, the students on the innovation tour, I've been on one myself um, in New York, the very first one we had um, earlier this year. And so the students you know, at each school were leading us as guides through, throughout the process, you know, having a visit classrooms, being open to our questions. Um, and that's one thing I don't think is, is normal, you know, very regular to have as a student guide, you know, because adults are so micromanaging a lot of the time, I think, of visitors to their sites um, and are, you know, afraid of what students are going to say or not confident that students will be the best ambassadors. But at the schools we went to, you know, the students were front and center um, as, you know, the learners, as the leaders, as the, you know, uh, peers, you know, going through the learning journey along with the staff. So that's, that's one thing. Um, also, the relevant projects, you know, project-based learning is something that's common to the schools. Um, that, that you know, they really were doing practical and um, meaning, personally meaningful projects. Um, and even if they were learning, you know, English again, it was something where they were, you know, um, putting on a Shakespeare play, for example, and really engaging in the characters, their motivations, and throughout that process learning the different literary devices. But it wasn't just memorizing literary devices and studying them out on a test. It was really active, participatory learning. So this what, is just a few. what about the relationship between the school and the parents? Are there commonalities there? That's a great question. I don't know that I, I got a sense of the, the relationship with the parents. Um, in these schools, I would say that overall they emphasize community. Um, and one of the places, Urban Academy, um, they have pictures all over the walls of students and the people who are closest to them. So as they graduate, they invite the students to take a, a photograph to you know, leave the legacy on the wall and to put in the picture, you know, to bring in anyone that's really meaningful to them. So there is a sense of family, and um, family is at the core part of the student's learning experience just by walking into the school and seeing you know, the faces on the wall. So I think this is our last question. Chris asks where the funding comes for IDEA. I think this document, the strategy document, actually is a, you have sort of an open uh, books kind of a policy and, and, and your budget is there and the kinds of fundraising you're doing. Do you want to address anything related to that? 
Sure. Yeah, transparency is definitely one of our values, and, and you know, our our website being updated with who funds those sections. That's the question we get. But um, yeah, we started with foundation funding from the Van Paul Foundation and New Vision Foundation. Um, with Saul Silbert Chair of the Trust. So these are small foundations that have a heart in you know, democratic education, participatory learning. And then also we you know, now are developing our individual donor base. And so actually it's a great segue. We're doing the holiday campaign we're launching tomorrow for fundraising. But um, yeah, it's really foundation funding and individual donations. We have some um, earned income through consulting and we, we have an education cities initiative project um, in Puerto Rico that um, brings in some income as well. Well, Leah, thanks so much for coming on tonight. A fascinating story. I just, I just love the reschool yourself idea, and I'm intrigued by you and your willingness to, to take that time and kind of figure things out. Thank you so much for having me, and I do apologize for all the technical difficulties. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with that. Nothing, nothing good comes at no cost. We are, our cost tonight <laughs> was dealing with technology, right. but we did fine. It has been a fascinating story. I'm clapping for you. It's the smiley face icon, and you scroll down to the applause. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, another, another wicked fan. No good deed goes unpunished. Or maybe that's, maybe that's prior to wicked, but I always think of the song. Hey, coming up on Thursday, another conversation, this time with Lisa Nielsen, Hacking Education, Thinking Outside the Box. Should be lots of fun. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Malia. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye now. Okie doke, folks. That was terrific. Really a great story. Kind of a fun way to relax during crazy busy December. Um, thanks for attending. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off now. And we will have to kick you out of the room for the recording to process. Take care. <laughs>